Thank you, sir. Gosh, right, crossing the river by feeling the stones. Uh, my name is Simon Wardley. I'm going to talk to you about maps. Can I just ask, has anybody heard of my form of mapping before? Wow. Uh, that, that's like about 5%, so, 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 so that's fabulous. Um, before I start, a uh, quick word of warning. Uh, I'm a scientist by training. I'm actually a genetic engineer. Uh, biology is my background, uh, which means I like graphs. Uh, I've done a quick graph. This is the level of audience pain, that is you, <laughs> against the number of slides given in a 50-minute talk. Now, I reckon there's a safe limit of about 90. Now, being a scientist, I like to experiment, uh, so I'll be using no less than 215. <laughs> um, I know what you're probably thinking. I mean, run away, where's the exit? Uh, but don't worry, I'm going to start off by giving you a map of where we're going. We're going to start off by talking about the issue of strategy, and then afterwards we're heading south, I'm afraid. And we're going to go into the subject of situational awareness and why maps might matter. And after that, we're going to talk about some patterns which you can use with maps. And if we're lucky, at the very end, depending upon how quickly I go, uh, we've got a magical mystery tour with things like nation-state competition, ecosystem, serverless, and, and Brexit. But uh, <laughs> we never quite get there. Uh, that's probably a metaphor for the whole thing itself. Um, Anyway, I want to start with the issue of strategy. So this subject is important for me. It started in 1996. I was in the, uh, at the lift of the Arts Hotel in Barcelona. And I was working for an American company. And one of the senior vice presidents handed me the strategy for the company and said, what do I think of this? And I looked through it. I leafed through it. I saw uh, you know, words like innovation, uh, efficiency, and culture. And I, I, I was young, and I didn't have a clue. So I turned around to them and said, I think it looks OK to me. And so I handed this back and felt very guilty afterwards about saying that. And about 10 years later, I, I was the CEO of an online photo service known as Vatango. We had about 16 different lines of business, um, about 10 million users in total, if you added all the different services together, somewhere in that region. And we had a strategy document, and it didn't make sense to me. I'd written it. I was the CEO. And so I handed it to one of the people who worked for me, and I could see them leafing through it, looking at it. And I said, what do you think? And they said, it looks OK to me. <laughs> and I sort of had this moment, this realization, um, that they didn't have a clue, and I didn't have a clue. So the problem with, with Fatango was the fat cat in charge, i.e. me, um, because I, I was a fake CEO, I was an imposter CEO, I was making it up uh, as I was going along. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But it was okay, we were profitable, and our revenue was growing. So everybody else thought we're doing fine. But rather than the chess playing master, I was more the alchemist, uh, you know, making it up magic frameworks, things like this. Uh, we had a vision statement. Uh, this is our vision statement from 2003. Our strategy is customer focused. We will lead an e innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. We'd adopted something called extreme programming in 2000. This is slightly before the term agile manifesto came out. And we were heavy users of open source. The problem with this vision statement was I'd pinched it from other companies. So, so it wasn't unique to us. I, I mean, I, I, I just didn't know how to, to make one. And I was starting to get worried that other people would eventually rumble that I didn't know what I was talking about. So I would go around listening to other CEOs talking about strategy. And I would record the words they would use. Uh, and the small words, I called them uh, business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. And I, I, I would put these lists together. I did this in 2014. Uh, these are the common BLAS in 2014. Uh, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, open source. I mean, if I did it today, what sort of words would we have? 
Blockchain. You've got to have a bit of blockchain. Um, and anything else? Machine learning. You've got to have a bit of AI. And all serverless, yes. You've got to have a bit of that and everything else. So, so what I then did was I took companies' vision statements and, and sort of multiple of them and sort of mashed them together and came up with a blah template. So... Our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I combined the blahs and the blah templates and just <laughs> auto-generated 64 random strategies. <coughs> Things like this, our strategy is customer focused. Uh, we will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative uh, um, cloud-based ecosystem. It's all random nonsense. Uh, this is night number two. <laughs> our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of, you know, I can barely say the words. They're, they're, they're that pain, painful. But what I would do is I would circulate this. I would send this out. And last time, I got about 400 responses of three basic types. Uh, the first type was, uh, this is the exact wording from our business plan. <laughs> The second was, I've seen two of these used already. <laughs> and, and the third, and my favorite, was, are you for hire? <laughs> so a friend of mine's put this all online, by the way. Uh, this is strategy as a service. Um, if, you, if, you, if you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL. It will automatically generate you one based upon nothing whatsoever. So uh, this is one from a recent. I mean, if you don't like it, it's really simple. You just press refresh. And um, it saves you a lot of money. Anyway, so, so I was sort of thinking there's something going wrong here. So I went back to first principles. I started off with Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? The art of war. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. First, understand your purpose, your moral imperative. And second, understand the uh, landscape. Whoops, the landscape that you're competing in. Then understand the climactic patterns. So these are the things changing uh, the landscape. Then you need to understand doctrine which is universal principles of organization. And finally, you get into the whole leadership bit. And then I came across a chap called John Boyd. Anybody heard of John Boyd? What's he famous for? OODA loops. So John Boyd, US Air Force pilot, came up with this idea of OODA loops. So, so what you have is the game. You need to observe the environment. That's what landscape and climactic patterns are around. And then you need to orientate yourself around this. That's what doctrine and universal principles are about. And then you need to decide where you're going to attack, and then you act. And so I had this, this cycle. I was quite excited uh, by this. I would show it to other people, and they would say, well, it doesn't matter. It's all about the importance of why. And that's interesting for me, because there's two whys here. There's the why of purpose, as in, you know, I, I want to be the best uh, tea shop in Ashford, a place where I live near. And there's the why of movement. Why do I make this choice over that choice? And they're very, very different things. So if you think of a game of chess, uh, the why of purpose might be to win the game. The why of movement is, do I move this piece or that piece? And those are different things. And if I move this piece, I get a positional advantage. If I move that piece, it's checkmate. So, so what happens, it's through the action of movement that I actually learn about the environment as long as I can describe it. So I went back to Fatango, and I had a look at our sort of purpose, and our purpose was a bit of a mess because we had organically grown 16 different lines of business all sort of mashed together. And I asked, well, how do we understand our landscape? the environment that we're competing in. And that brought me into a subject known as situational awareness. Now, anybody with a military background here? So how important is situational awareness in, in the military world? So, me, 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 hi, hi, low? <laughs> hi. <laughs> OK, good, right, super. Uh, for the rest of you, I'm going to explain it with three um, uh, examples. Vikings, chess, and Themistocles. So Vikings, very frightening people. Uh, this is how Vikings used to navigate. 
uh, from Herman, head due west towards Half, and you will have sailed north of Hatland. They used to use stories. So you used to learn epic stories, and then you would be put in charge of the boats, and you would navigate with a story. Now that story, well, the full story, actually means that. Now that's the, the mapping equivalent. So I've got a quick question for you. What would you use to navigate? Visual map or a verbal story? Map? Who, who thinks map? Who thinks story? Okay, so maps win in this case. All right. So what do we use in business? Stories. Right, okay, super. So, so the next one is chess world. So I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess. And how well you play the game determines your ranking in this world. But no one's ever seen a chessboard. All you've ever seen are these characters on a screen. And you play the game very simply. Um, you press a button, pawn, and your opponent sees which button you've pressed. They counter, pawn. Uh, you counter, pawn. They counter, um, well, queen. And then the game goes on for ages and ages until, you know, somebody wins or more likely it's a draw. Now, what will happen is after many games, we will start collecting these sequences and put them into our big data systems and start to discover secrets of success. So if you press queen, I should respond with knight, pawn, rook, or whatever it happens to be. Um, we like secrets of success. Uh, if you've ever read something like HBR, uh, this is my favorite business article from HBR. It's uh, November 2011, so it's not an April Fool's. It's how earlobes can signify leadership potential. It is the phrenology of management. I mean, I, I, I always suggest you, you go into the boardroom, find the CEO, measure their earlobes, and then, uh, and then say, you know, we're not going to be successful or something like that, just, just for the fun of it. Um, don't sue me afterwards. Um, anyway, so what will happen is you'll play this game, and you'll get very good at this, and you'll be playing it for years and learning all these sequences, and then you'll play against them, pretty much a novice. But they will see something magical they will see the board. And so you'll move, uh, and they'll counter, and then you'll move, and they'll counter, and you'll have lost. And you'll be sitting there going, what the fiddlesticks happened there? The first thing you're going to do is write down that sequence as though it's some super secret, magic secret of success. And you're going to use it. What's going to happen when you use it against this player? Are you going to win? No, 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 you're going to lose. Right. So, so you'll lose again. So now you'll start getting desperate. You'll start thinking maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the speed at which they press the button. So you'll start recording the time pulses between the presses of the button. How's that going to help you? It's not. So now you're going to go, right, maybe it's cultural. Maybe they're a happy sort of person. How's that going to help you? It's not. Okay, you lose because they exist in what's known as a high-level situational awareness environment. I mean, they're constantly learning from uh, the context in which they're competing. So, quick question for you. What would you use to learn? Secrets of success or context-specific play? Context-specific play. Yeah, I'd agree. Right, so what do we use in business? <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, so last example is um, Themistocles. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem the Persians were invading. Uh, there are about 170,000 Persians. Um, Themistocles uh, was in charge of the, uh, the Greek uh, army, which was made up of the city-states. Um, so 170,000 Persians invading. What he decided to do was block off the streets of Artemisium, force the Persians along the coastal road into a narrow pass called Thermopylae, and where a small number of troops could slow down or at least defend for a time against a larger force. And there was 4,000 odd Greeks, including 300 Spartans. And that's the story of the Spartans. Fantastic. Right, so I want you to imagine your members of the Athenian uh, 
city-state, so you're part of the Greek army. It's the eve of battle. I am Themistocles. I'm giving you purpose and moral imperative. We want to defend against the, uh, the invading Persian hordes. And then I tell you, I don't understand the landscape. I don't understand the environment. I don't have a map. But have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> Strengths a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the ephors might stop the, uh, the uh, Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. <laughs> Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans. And threats, the Persians get rid of us. And the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. Okay, so what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement as described by a map, so you go to you know, the Straits of Artemisium, you go to Thermopylae, or would you use some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram? What would you use? Position and movement. Okay, you know what's coming. What do we use in business? Okay. So if I look at chess versus alchemy, if I look at navigation, learning, and strategy, then chess is all visual, context-specific. It's all about position and movement. It's what we call a high-level situational awareness environment. It's a bit like the military. If you ask a general, why did you bomb that hill, they won't tell you, um, because I read an article in General Weekly that bombing hills was the new thing. <laughs> Or that I got this consultant report saying that 67% of other generals are bombing hills. Or, or that I thought it would be a good story. Um, they would tell you all about position and movement and the advantage it would create in the landscape. Now, alchemy is all about storytelling, secrets of success, magic frameworks, and it's a low-level situational awareness environment. And that's where I was. Uh, there I was as this fake CEO, and I wanted to move over here. So I used to say that to people, and they would say, but we're successful. Well, I was successful. Revenue growing, uh, profitability up, but business is little more than a cat fight. And it's okay to be utterly blind to the environment you're competing in as long as everybody else is. If no one can see the environment, no one gains an advantage. Now, one of my favorite studies is this piece of work by Marcus Fitzer, which looked at uh, decomposition effects, or uh, impacts of CEO effects, basically. Um, and he, he looked at many thousands of CEOs and determined that 70% had no impact beyond random signal, noise, and chance. And, and the remaining percentage, I mean, a, a, a small percentage had a positive. Uh, pretty much the conclusion was you could replace your board with anybody off the street and it probably wouldn't matter much, uh, which is probably why it's not a very popular paper. But I, no, no, nonetheless, it's great. Um, to, so I'd say this, and people would get angry with me, my friends, you know, we're not stupid. And I'm not saying people are. I'm not saying the Vikings were daft to use stories. It's just that what they were familiar with. Um, the issue, now I understand the difference, I suppose, is the existence or non-existence of a way of describing the environment you're competing in. Now, I would say that to people. And they'd say, but, you know, we have maps. Well, let's think about what makes a map. A map has certain characteristics. It's visual. It's context-specific. It's the battle at hand. You have the position of pieces relative to some form of anchor. So in a geographical map, the anchor is the compass. And you have consistency of movement. So if I want to go from Thebes to Athens, which way would I go? Southeast, okay? And it would be consistently southeast. If I went from Thebes to Athens and I suddenly arrived at Thermopylae, then either the map's wrong or my sense of direction <laughs> is very wrong. So there's consistency of movement. Anyway, people would say, but we have maps. And so I started to look at the maps that I had. I had things like this, a systems map. Anybody seen one of these before? Yeah? Good. Right. So I'll take something like CRM, this box here, and I'll move it over here. Has that changed the map? <laughs> no? Right. If I shift Australia 
on a map and put it next to Amsterdam, does that change the meaning of that map? Right. The problem with this map is it's not a map. It doesn't have any navigational characteristics. And in a map, the other thing about a map is the space has meaning. So you can't just shift things. It's all right. I had business process maps. Anybody seen one of these before? Yes? Good. Right. Well, they're not maps either. Um, I have, we, well, these days we have things like this. Have, has anybody seen one of these? Digital roadmap. You know, if I want to go from predictive campaign analytics to A-B testing, I have to go through the station of mobile analytics, marketing analytics, social analytics. Where it's just pure gibberish. It's also not a map. Uh, then I had things like this, mind maps. Do you want to have a guess? Yeah, they're not maps either. Uh, if you, you know, the space here doesn't, they have an anchor, they have position to an extent, there's no consistency of movement. So the problem I found was we kept using that term, but I did not think it meant what we thought it meant. So I needed to somehow create a map of my business. Now, remember, I'm this CEO who's a fake CEO, I'm, I'm an imposter. Uh, I need to create a map. I'm assuming everybody else in the world has maps. I'm the only person who doesn't. And that was 2005. It took me to 2012, seven years, to discover I wasn't actually the only person who was making it up. Now, anyway, to solve this problem, being a Brit, I had a cup of tea. And it was whilst I was having a cup of tea, I was sitting there, I realized that as a user, I had a need for a cup of tea. And that tea has needs. It needs tea, it needs hot water. And hot water has needs, it needs cold water, it needs a kettle. And kettle has needs, it needs power. So what I've got here is an anchor at the top and position in a chain of needs. So I was able to take my map and, uh, well, my non-map, and reorganize it, putting the customer at the top and putting everything in a chain of needs. And so that's what that looks like. I've got an anchor at the top, the customer, position in a value chain. The stuff at the top is what's visible to them. The stuff at the bottom is less visible. So you start off with online photo storage, uh, website, platform, compute, all the way down to power. Now, the problem with this is it's still not a map because I'm missing movement. So I looked at one bit, power, looked in the history of power. We start off with a Parthian battery, 400 AD. Uh, we can argue about whether it was or wasn't. Over time, we get utility provision of electricity through various stages, like the Hippolyte Pixie, Siemens generators. So there seemed to be a process of evolution. And evolution is change, is movement. So if I could describe that or model that, I could describe movement itself. So it took me several months, and this pattern came up. If I look at the ubiquity and the certainty of something, we start off with the genesis of uh, novel and new acts. Uh, then we get custom-built examples, products, uh, implementing the same act, then rental services. Eventually, it becomes commodity and utility services. So that graph of evolution, I can use that to, to describe movement. So I've got my value chain, my anchor and position. I flatten my graph at the bottom. And now I simply put things in the right bucket. So Genesis custom-built product commodity, put things in the right bucket. And that was the first map I produced in 2005. What I've got is anchor, position, movement. And in this map, the space has meaning. So if you shift compute from product to commodity, that is a change of what compute is. A couple of things with maps. One, all maps are imperfect, even geographical maps. A perfect map of France is one-to-one -one scale, which means it's the size of France, which means it's France, <laughs> which is useless. <laughs> you can take that whichever way you wish. <laughs> um, the second thing, it's a model. Or at least the evolution side is a model. And like all models, it's wrong. 
Uh, the map itself is a, a combination of different things. It's just a way of visualizing. So the entire map is not really a model. It's, a, it's interpretation or realization, a way of communicating what we believe is there. So what? Well, the thing about maps is once you have a map, you can start to learn patterns about an environment. So if I go back to my my uh, cycle, if I can observe the landscape, I can start to observe climactic patterns. So these are the rules that influence the game. And the first one you notice is everything evolves. If there's supply and demand competition, your map is not static. Everything's moving from left to right. The second thing you notice is that characteristics change as it evolves. It doesn't matter whether it's money or penicillin. It starts off in this uncharted space where it's chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable. Over time, it becomes industrialized, ordered, standard, boring, dull. Now, that was quite useful for me. Because I said we'd adopted extreme programming. We'd adopted extreme programming everywhere. And of course, it wasn't working. So what we realized is that extreme programming, very, very lightweight, XP, pair programming, test-driven development, was very strong in this uncharted space because it helped us reduce the cost of change, and change was the norm. But things like Six Sigma, outsourcing, even Waterfall, was very strong in that right-hand space, because it helped reduce deviation. We, could def we already knew what we wanted. We could describe it. Now, things like Lean, and by that I mean things like you know, taking Scrum and Kanban and having other artifacts like MVP, was very strong in the middle. So what we learned was there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all method. And it's not just with project management, it's also with things like purchasing as well. Now, the next pattern we learned was as things evolve, they become more efficient, uh, but they also enable higher-order systems. So the speed at which we can build these higher-order systems increases the more industrialized the underlying components are. And that's a concept known as componentization uh, from uh, uh, Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. So as the underlying components become industrialized, the speed at which we can build and explore the, uh, uh, well, the adjacent unexplored, the, the, the novel and new accelerates. And this novel and new, though it's uncertain, has future sources of value and worth. We just don't know which one is going to be successful. So back then, it was things like you had television or uh, uh, the refrigeration blanket. Which one's going to win? Uh, the, the blanket which keeps you cool or a box with moving pictures? Well, well you'd go the blanket, of course, because um, that's obvious. But yes, it was the box with moving pictures. And so what happens is as things evolve, they enable higher order systems. They evolve enabling higher order systems. They evolve enabling high, and so it repeats. And so when you look at a map, it's a line in a constantly moving environment. Now, the next pattern you learn is the Red Queen, um, Professor Van Valen. The need to continuously evolve in order to stand still in a surrounding ecosystem. So if you're competing against others and one company adapts to, say, more evolved activities, whatever it happens to be, uh, they create pressure on everybody else to adapt. And the more that adapt, the more that pressure mounts. So ultimately, you have no choice. Things like cloud computing, you didn't have a choice about it. It wasn't a question of if, it was simply a question of when. Uh, next pattern you learn is that past success breeds inertia. So we get very good at something, and so we have inertia to this change. So Blockbuster, Netflix, who was first with a website? Blockbuster, who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, who was first with experimenting with video streaming? Blockbuster, great, who went bankrupt first? <laughs> Blockbuster, hang on, they out-innovated the market, but they went, how's that possible? Do you know why? Do you know where the inertia came from? It was the stores. It was the late fees. It's actually late fees which were the problem. That's where they made money. So there's about 30 common economic patterns, of which I've described a few, 
And you can use these for basic anticipation of change. So that's what we did in 2005. We had a map. We knew compute would go to a utility. So would platform. We, know, we knew we had, would have inertia to this change that it would enable higher order systems to appear. And why does that matter? Well, that's important because it tells us multiple points that we can attack. We could uh, you know, concentrate on the service, build the world's first compute as a service or platform, or build something new on top of those. So we had multiple points of attack, and now we can start to ask that why of movement question. Okay. So the other bit is doctrine. So when you look at patterns, there are some that you have no choice over. Those are climactic patterns, the rules of the game. The other ones, you can decide whether to use them or not. Some of them are universally useful, so you should use them. Some of them are context-specific, so you should use them, but only in the right context. So the first lot are the universally applicable patterns. There's about 40 of them, and I'm not going to go through. I'm just going to go through a handful. I'm going to start with the emergency services mobile communication platform, a big, big infrastructure project, wonderful, massive, great big uh, uh, specification document. If you ask people what was the user needs, people would point to the document and say, somewhere in there. <laughs> so the first thing, and it took them a couple of hours, is they drew a map. And one of the beauties about maps is because the anchor is customers. I, you can have customers, you can have regulators, you could have the business, multiple anchors at the top, uh, which uh, you have to start by describing their needs. So we had the uh, user at the top, what they required, emergency function, point-to-point -point communication. But the doctrine here is focus on user needs. Turns out that's quite a good thing to do. But once you've done that, you need to know the details. So you need to think small, as much of the details as you can do. One of the beauties about maps is you won't have all the information. So you can share them with other people, and they can go, oh, you've got that wrong, you're missing this, oh, that's a commodity, for some reason you're custom building kettles, or whatever it happens to be. So you need to know the details. Now, one of the beauties is once you've got a map, you can share it with others. And you obviously discover that not only do you get things wrong, but other people are building what you're building. So like immigration borders, please, you share the maps, you start going, oh, we're doing that, oh, we're doing that. And so you can build profile diagrams to discover duplication in systems and also bias, where we're custom building what's a commodity. Now, I used to think that government was inefficient. The worst example of duplication I've got in any government is 118 workflow systems doing the same thing. I've got a pharmaceutical company with 350 teams building enterprise content management systems. And at one of the global architect meetings, one of the global architects went and said, don't worry, we're building the global enterprise content management system. To which another architect, about two seconds later, went, we're doing that. Five global efforts to build the global enterprise content. This is a pharma company. Uh, I've got a bank with a thousand risk management systems. So anything you think about duplication and waste in government is really bad. Private sector, we excel. Okay, so once you get through this process of uh, um, removing duplication from your map, then you get into things like FIST, US Air Force, fast, inexpensive, simple, and tiny. What they learned was it was a good idea to break down big systems into small components and treat them as small components. They used it for the Harvest Hawk marine combat aircraft, which went from paper to combat operations in 18 months, fired its first shot in 90 months. That's really fast for military hardware. So what you do is you, you take your map and you break it down into small components. And you think small. Now, once you've done that, you may as well start applying relevant techniques. So you use Agile on the left-hand side, maybe Lean, off-the-shelf products in the middle, start using outsourcing, maybe Six Sigma on the right. No one-size-fits-all. Multiple methods all at the same time. Now, of course, when we looked at the contract structure, we had a problem, because that's what the contract structure actually looked like. When people don't have maps, they tend to have these big contracts covering everything. And that's a problem. And to explain why it's a problem, I'm going to use a self-driving car. 
Do you know what a world perception server is? No? Anybody from finance? Right, I'm going to pretend you're all from finance. Which means most things in IT are elvish to you. And I'm going to give you a systems diagram for a self-driving car, not a map. Systems diagram, which I've translated into elvish. Now I'm going to ask you questions. Should we outsource or build our own? Should we outsource or build our own? What do you think? Build our own. What do you, what do you think? To, okay. <laughs> I'm going to take exactly the same diagram. This is mapping format. A, it's exactly the same. Should we outsource or build our own? B, should we outsource or build our own? Okay, I'll turn it back into English. You can actually see what it is. And so most organizations don't, that's their map. And, and onto this, uh, we apply one size fits all methods. So we tend to yo yo. You know, we go all agile, all Six Sigma, whatever. You know, flip between the two. Um, you know, somebody does a bit of agile over here, really works well. Let's do the entire thing agile. Uh, somebody does, oh, Six Sigma works well. Have you, has anybody been in an organization like that? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, then we outsource the whole thing. That's another great thing as well, because what will happen is some parts get efficiently treated, and bits over here will incur um, massive change control cost. The uncharted space will change. You can't define it. So you know, you've tried to specify the unspecifiable. And invariably, you get into a fight with a vendor, and eventually, somebody on your, t your side uh, normally betrays you by saying, next time, we need to specify it better. You can't specify it better. That just, I mean, it's pretty much a scam. OK. So you get to the point of realizing yeah, you need to break it down, use appropriate methods. And if you've broken it down this way, you may as well start using small team structures, so cell-based structures. And then you start realizing that attitude is different. So it doesn't matter whether we talk about finance operations or marketing or engineering. Engineering over here is not the same as engineering over here. So you end up implementing structures which are mindful of the different attitudes, different cultures. So we end up with pioneers, settlers, town planners. So pioneers are very good at basically creating the, the novel and new flaky. They build, run, and operate in that space. Um, settlers tend to steal from them and create things which are actually useful to other people. And, and town planners are brilliant at industrializing. They build the empires of scale. So you, you realize you, get, you have different cultures. And you, then you introduce basically a system of theft. Um, so you start to design for constant evolution. So that was sort of state of the art 2005, uh, so 12 years ago, well, 13 years ago now. Um, there's a wonderful paper, GCHQ Boiling Frogs, uh, which is all open source. Just search for Boiling Frogs. Um, it's, uh, it talks about three-party structures and other things. Well worth reading. So once you get past, you've got the purpose, we start to understand the landscape, we start to learn about climactic patterns, so we can start to anticipate certain effects, we can describe the environment as well. Uh, then we get into doctrine, there's about 40 different forms of doctrine, so these are basic you know, ways of organizing and structuring. Uh, then we get into the, the leadership, the context-specific play stuff. So context-specific play, there's about 70 different forms of this. Uh, so you have a map, you anticipate where things are going, we have that discussion, we look at where we can attack, now we ask, you know, can we manipulate the environment to our favor? And there's all sorts of techniques. Uh, uh, open source is great for industrializing. You can slow things down with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, you, you don't want to use that cloud stuff, it's dangerous. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of um, constraints you can use. Anyway, there's about 70 different mechanisms. And from that, uh, you build a context-specific play. So this is what we did in 2005. Um, we, we built a play which was basically, we, we expected somebody else to launch uh, uh, computers, a utility. I actually thought it was going to be Google. It was um, Amazon the next year. So we decided to build a, a platform play. 
It was a, a JavaScript platform built entire applications front and back end in, in JavaScript uh, with uh, uh, billing to the function, so it had functional billing. Uh, you didn't worry about servers or anything along those lines. Uh, we knew people would have inertia, so we had an open source play, and we had a particular ecosystem model. Uh, it's known as ILC, where basically you industrialize something to a bunch of uh, APIs, you let people build on top, and then you mine metadata to find future patterns which you then commoditize. So the next thing is to, is to act. And of course, when you act, it changes your purpose and landscape, and of course, you keep on looping around the cycle. So that's what we did. We launched Zimke in 2006, and then later in the year, Amazon had launched. Uh, it's what you would now call a serverless environment. Um, it was growing like hot cakes. Uh, unfortunately, the parent company had a big strategy consultancy firm, an American one, uh, come in and explain the, the uh, three things that we were doing as a result of Maps, uh, which was this um, cloud computing, uh, the use of mobile phones as cameras and 3D printing, were not, in fact, the future. Uh, the future was... Television, 3D television, to be specific. Uh, so uh, the parent company, unfortunately, decided, well, cloud, 3D printing, mobile phones as cameras is not the future. Uh, we've just been told that. The future is 3D TV. So shut it all down and spend a billion on 3D TV. Right, who has a 3D TV here? <laughs> who uses a 3D TV? All right, who, who uses a mobile phone as camera? Anybody use cloud here? Anybody 3D printing? OK, so, so we made a really bad error. There we are. Um, so then I went to a company called Ubuntu. Anybody heard of Ubuntu? Yay, fantastic. So what we did, we mapped out the environment, used the uh, map to determine where to attack, where to invest. I spent about half a million. It was 18 months. Uh, we were about 2% of the operating system market. Uh, we took 70% of all cloud computing in that 18 months. Does anybody remember that, that moment? It was 2008 to 2010, but it was all Red Hat, Red Hat, Microsoft, and then suddenly it was Ubuntu. Anybody remember that? Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so then I wrote something uh, with uh, others, uh, Liam Maxwell, called Better for Less, which was how to transform uh, uh, government. That helped in the formation of spend control and also structures like GDS. Uh, this is a picture of Liam, uses mapping within government, uh, talking about another service they've saved 425 million by simply mapping. Uh, most of my stuff is in nation state competition, China versus USA, etc. Uh, and friends of mine even write books with mapping. This is the uh, Puntress Scrove, which was a science fiction book written with mapping. It's now just been, it's been bought and turned into a, a major Hollywood film. So it's, it's coming to a cinema near you. There we are. Now, now, most times, people go, God, this is terribly complex. You talk about 30 economic patterns, you know, 40 different forms of doctrine, uh, 70 different forms of gameplay. Um, but it's not really complex. It's a bit like this. You know, we laugh about using a magic framework in combat because we understand the importance of a geographical map in such a space. But we use a magic framework in business because that's what we're familiar with. The problem with mapping is just we're not familiar with, with mapping our environments. <coughs> so to summary, there I was, the fake CEO. Um, I realized there was a cycle to strategy. Um, I realized that you know, it was important to act in order to learn. But if I'm acting, it would be a good idea to understand or at least observe the landscape. And what I discovered is I had no way of doing this, so I had to develop my own. Um, I thought this is what everybody learned at MBA schools, but it turns out they don't. Um, and, uh, well, actually, these days I do teach it a couple. But um, the other thing, not only is it important to act and understand your environment, uh, the entire process is actually iterative. The more times you, you do this, the more patterns you learn, the better you get at the game. And the entire presentation can be summarized uh, you know, in just the simple statement of crossing the river uh, by feeling the stones, it's Deng Xiaoping. Um, have a purpose and direction. Um, you have to you know, take small iterative steps and learn about the environment as you go. So at that point, I will say, uh, if you want to read more about maps, it's all Creative Commons. I made it Creative Commons long ago. Um, I've got a book, 600 pages, just help yourself. Um, 
and, and or you just tweet me or whatever. Those are my, my, my details. And don't worry, I will put these uh, slides up. Now, I've got five minutes to go, so I can take you into the danger zone. Uh, we can talk about a whole bunch of things like serverless ecosystems, flow, evolution, weak signals, nation-state competition, that's Brexit, uh, fool's mate and competitor analysis. We're not going to get to the Brexit, so I'm afraid, because uh, I don't have the capability of jumping ahead. I have to go through each of these to, to explain. Um, or you can ask questions. Anybody want to know about serverless? Do you all know serverless? Who knows serverless here? Okay, anybody understand? Do the rest of you know that this is totally going to transform the way you develop things? No. Anybody a DevOps person here? Okay. Let me explain serverless. Compute. When compute was a product, when we built applications, we built using architectural practices based upon the characteristics of computers as a product. What I'm, those characteristics including something called high MTTR, so high mean time to recovery. So when your server went bang, it would take you weeks to get a new one. So what we did is we built emerging architectural practice, things like capacity planning. Because if it's going to take you weeks to get a new one, you don't want to run out of space. Things like M plus one. Anybody remember M plus one? And things like disaster recovery tests. Anybody remember those? Yeah? Okay, so they evolved and basically became best practice for the use of computers as a product. And we would laugh at people. You know, lol, you didn't do your capacity planning, your, your emails ran out of disk space, or whatever it happened to be. Anyway, what happened is compute evolved uh, to more of a utility. Now, marketing didn't like computers as a utility, so we came up with a useless term, and we called it cloud. By the way, there are no clouds involved in cloud. Um, as a result, we got co-evolved practices. That's perfectly normal. So it has a new set of characteristics. It's a low MTTR, low mean time to recovery. So we get a new emerging practice. So rather than scale up, we scale out. It's distributed systems. Uh, we do design for failure. Uh, we use chaos engines, constant introduction of failure to ensure our system is resilient. Uh, we don't have to wait for weeks for new servers, so we have continuous deployment, and that leads into things like continuous integration. Those new practices created a new tribe. They evolved, and we gave them a term. After several years, we called them DevOps. Well, it was Andy and Patrick who called them DevOps. That's called co-evolution. Very standard climactic pattern. Now, what happened, of course, is... Um, People wanted to be in this cloudy world. So, you know, business schools wrote articles, how scrub out earlobes, put in cloud, how cloud can signify leadership potential. So lots of CEOs run around saying, you know, make my legacy cloudy. Uh, they'd take their, 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 their legacy and stick it into Amazon. Amazon would have an outage, and, and people would run around screaming, the end of cloud is nigh. <laughs> to which you would go, shouldn't our architecture evolve as well, and to which they would go, burn him heretic. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, you, you experienced it. It was great. And that's because these people over here had inertia to this change, because this is a set of less developed practices, but they are practices developed for that cloud world rather than the computers a product world. So naturally you had inertia, and vendors would charge in with what you need is an enterprise cloud. <laughs> so enterprise cloud, I want all the benefits of volume operations, uh, commodity components, but built with non-commodity hardware customized to my needs. To which you'd go, ah, you can I change the laws of physics, commodity. Anyway, still, nonetheless, didn't stop people spending billions on this. I mean, um, I had a particular company, they, they, they spent a billion, they, they told me they were going to spend a billion. I told them I could give them the same effect for 20 million. And they went, how would you do that? And I said, well, you pay me 20 million, I'll sit on a beach for five years drinking margaritas, and then I'll phone you up and say, we failed. And that way you would have saved 900. Anyway, about. <laughs> <laughs> About six years later, they did say, we wish you'd given the 20 million. <laughs> um, anyway, the same thing's going on with platform. 
So you've got a product stack shifting into a more commodity world. So you've got things like Lambda, it's got functional billing and all this sort of stuff. And what you're getting is a co-evolved practice. Now, naturally, we don't go platform as a utility because that would be sensible. Uh, we give a rubbish name like serverless. By the way, there are servers. It's a bit like cloud. There's no clouds, but in this case, there are servers. Um, and you get a new practice. Now, we haven't got a meme for that. Uh, so we call it Jeff, because Paul's daughter, uh, uh, when we were trying to think, what should we call this, went, well, call it Jeff. All right, so Jeff it is, until someone comes up with like a DevOps term. And that's the combination of finance and development in that space. And so that's where you should be investing, uh, serverless and those new practices. And that's forming a new tribe. And all the other stuff is, um, is basically legacy, including all the stuff below the line. The problem is, if you run around telling people that, you know, DevOps is the new legacy, they all respond with burn him heretic, <laughs> which, you know, <laughs> you know, their idea is young serverless, I will teach you so much, you know. It's like ITIL and DevOps, yeah, young DevOps, I will teach you so much, to which the polite response is no thanks DevOps or no thanks ITIL. You know, basically tribe's got a try, but... Um, <laughs> That, that's, the, that's the serverless story. Um, I could go into ecosystems, but I think we're... Uh, are we, should we... Should we well, I would just say thank you very much, and you can always grab me out there. Thank you.